Thank you all for your patience as we reset. We now recognize the second panel of witnesses. Mr. Charles Edward is Acting Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security. Welcome. And Mr. John Verde is Senior Counsel and Director of Open Government Project at EPIC. Pursuant, as you saw in the first round, to the committee rules, would you please rise, raise your right hand to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Since you were patient through the first round, I won't recite, re recite anything. With that, we recognize Mr. Edwards for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I am Charles K. Edwards, Acting Inspector General for Department of Homeland Security, DHS. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss DHS efforts to disclose information under the Freedom of Information Act, also known as FOIA. My testimony today focuses on our review of the DHS FOIA program, as well as the March 2011 report, the DHS Privacy Office Implementation of the Freedom of Information Act. During the review, we found that the Office of the Secretary's involvement in the FOIA process creates delays and causes the Department to violate the 20 business day statutory response requirement. DHS has a substantial FOIA caseload. In fiscal year 2009, it received 103,093 FOIA requests, or 18 percent of the Federal Government's 557,000 and 825 requests. In fiscal year 2010, the number of requests increased by 26 percent to 130,098. Under the guidance of the Chief FOIA Officer, the DHS Privacy Office staff processed requests for the Privacy Office and eight headquarters offices, while most of the Department's major components process requests under the guidance of their own FOIA officers. The Privacy Office also promotes proactive disclosure, which increases the Department's level of transparency, while potentially decreasing the number of FOIA requests that the agency receives. However, despite our positive findings, there were certain aspects of the DHS FOIA process that caused concern. Specifically, we determined that the Office of Secretary's involvement in the FOIA process created inefficiencies that hampered full implementation of the FOIA process. Although components have been required to notify the Office of the Secretary of certain FOIA cases since 2005, this policy did not require that the Office of the Secretary review the actual FOIA releases. Instead, the process provided information about what was being disclosed. However, in September 2009, with respect to these FOIA cases, components were required to provide all the material intended for release to the Office of the Secretary for review and concurrence. Until such time, the components were prohibited from releasing the FOIA responses. This additional level of review and concurrence delayed the release of materials and in some cases caused the Department to violate the statutory timeline. Department officials have stated that advanced knowledge of significant releases can improve the DHS response to media inquiries that often follow the public release of information about DHS activities. Although we understand the Department's reasoning, we do not consider that delaying a FOIA release is the best public policy, particularly when such delays lead to the violation of the statutory deadline. We make several recommendations in our report that promote the Privacy Office's proposals and initiate. We recommend that DHS first develop additional policies on proactive disclosure, second, formalize the roles and responsibilities of the public liaison, and third, implement the internal review function to maximize efficiencies and improve the administration of FOIA operations. In addition, we recommend that the Chief FOIA Officer regularly make recommendations to the Secretary 
for adjustments to agency practices, policies, personnel, and funding as necessary to improve implementation of the DHS FOIA program, reduce the Department's exposure to legal risk, and implement the President's vision as articulated in the 2009 guidance. In conclusion, the Department has made some important progress in administration of the FOIA. We recognize the challenges involved in processing a large number of FOIA requests each year, especially in a timely manner. By implementing our recommendations, we trust that the Privacy Office can improve the overall efficiency in the DHS FOIA disclosure program. We look forward to additional collaboration during the corrective action process. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you or the committee members may have. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Verde. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is John Verde, and I am Senior Counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, commonly called EPIC. I am Director of EPIC's Open Government Project. We have a longstanding interest in open government particularly in the power of transparency to ensure accountability for, FET, for executive agencies. Since EPIC's establishment in 1994, we have filed Freedom of Information Act requests with Federal agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, concerning domestic surveillance programs and emerging electronic privacy topics. FOIA has helped to guarantee the public's right to know for generations of Americans. President Obama made open government and transparency a hallmark of his administration on his first day in office, stating that, quote, the Freedom of Information Act should be administered with a clear presumption. In the face of doubt, openness prevails, unquote. But political review of FOIA requests is antithetical to the fundamental values that undergird the Act. In EPIC's history of successful FOIA practice, we have never encountered policies like the DHS program at issue at today's hearing. EPIC often clashes with agencies over the application of exemptions. We battle agencies' failure to comply with statutory deadlines. We frequently litigate, challenging agencies' alleged legal bases for withholding specific records. But we have never observed practices that flag FOIA requests for political review. We are not aware of any other program that has singled out FOIA requests based on politically sensitive content or the identity of the requester. In our experience, this program is unique and it is uniquely harmful. Political review delays the release of records and raises the specter of wrongful withholdings. EPIC's experience with DHS from 2009 through this morning has been almost exclusively characterized by improper delays. Since 2009, the Department of Homeland Security has failed to comply with FOIA deadlines in 100 percent of requests filed by EPIC. It has failed to comply with multiple deadlines regarding some single requests. These delays pose real frustrations for even the savviest FOIA requesters. For the majority of FOIA requesters, delays can prevent the disclosure of records in a useful time frame or they can preclude the disclosure at all. Federal law simply does not permit agencies to select FOIA requests for political scrutiny of either the request or of the requester. The political review process raises the specter of political influence over disclosure. It is unlawful. Unless records fall within one of nine narrow statutory exemptions, anyone who seeks documents under FOIA is entitled to receive them. No provision of the Act allows an agency to deny a FOIA request or delay its response for political reasons. In fact, the law requires expedited processing of records concerning ongoing Federal activities just the sort of disclosures that were delayed by DHS's political review. Although DHS alleges that political vetting no longer occurs, there has been no formal publication confirming an end to the policy. And the Inspector General's report describes ongoing political review. We are troubled that political vetting apparently continues at DHS, and we are deeply concerned that such unlawful review might be practiced by other executive agencies. Finally, I wish to highlight another DHS policy unilateral administrative closures that contravenes the FOIA, thereby reducing transparency and hindering accountability. Based on EPIC's experience, EPIC has four recommendations. First, DHS should immediately cease political review of FOIA requests. Second, DHS should immediately disclose all agency records responsive to FOIA requests, including the request by the AP, that were subject to political review. Third, all other executive agencies should immediately cease political review of FOIA requests and report to this committee 
the extent to which they engaged in such review. And fourth, all agencies should certify as part of their annual FOIA reporting requirements that no FOIA requests were reviewed by political appointees. I thank you for your interest and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. And I think you both set a record. Each of you stayed under the five minutes. Uh, uh, at this time, I am going to recognize the gentleman from Michigan for his five-minute uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am surprised to be sitting this far down on the dais and have uh, the opportunity to, to question first. That is great. Sir, you are number one with me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is why I like this committee. I serve on uh, Homeland Security as well, so this, of course, is very, very interesting to me because not only are we responsible for making sure that our homeland is secure, but that those that are making our homeland secure are secure in the fact that we want to know and uh, ought to have that information. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for, for being here today. Um, Mr. Verdi, um, you made several statements about the political appointee review process. You used some words like antithetical, harmful, but the word that really caught my attention was unlawful, that uh, you believe it is unlawful for political appointees to be involved in the FOIA review process. Why? Well, I believe it to be unlawful for political appointees to be involved in the political review process at DHS for this reason. The criteria um, under which those appointees were reviewing requests um, includes criteria including the identity of the requester and the subject matter of the request. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court in, in two cases, one is National Archives versus Favish and one is uh, DOJ versus Reporters Committee in 1989, um, has held that neither the identity of the requester nor the content of the request is relevant to the agency's obligations under FOIA. So these political criteria, the identity of the requester, whether or not the request relates to a presidential ag or agency priority, um, the content of the request, the Supreme Court has spoken and has said that unless the request implicates documents concerning one of nine narrow exemptions, that those records must be disclosed. And that is why I believe this political review process to be unlawful. It considers factors um, that the United States Supreme Court has stated are simply irrelevant. Mr. Edwards, would you concur and why? Can you, re repeat, can you repeat the question? On the political review process being unlawful. I mean, we heard the words antithetical, harmful, it's all negative, but unlawful steps up to a higher plane. Well, Unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles have no place in the new era of open government the President has proclaimed. So we think that the significant review process just delays and there should be no delay. The Secretary has overall authority over her personnel. So we don't think it is unlawful, yet we don't like any delays to be because when the career FOIA personnel have finished reviewing it, it should be going out the door. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Verdi, uh, would you consider the DHS awareness process a review? Uh, my understanding of, of the quote unquote awareness process as it was described today is that it f continues to flag FOIA requests uh, for special consideration based on political factors, factors that have nothing to do with the FOIA statute or the application of exemptions. Um, so as far as I can tell, that is a review. Uh, the Committee's report and the Inspector General's report, and I believe Ms. Callahan's testimony earlier today, indicates that if um, political staff identifies issues um, that they want to see resolved before a FOIA request goes out, that they can halt the disclosure during that one day review period. So that strikes me as certainly constituting a review and not simply an awareness process. Okay. Um, the July 2009 directive from Mary Ellen Callahan, and uh, I, I, I pose this to uh, Mr. Verdi. Uh, that directive referenced in EPIC's letter to OGIS specifies that the FOI office must provide to the front office the requester's name, city, state, affiliation, and description of organization, if not widely known. Is it lawful? 
for DHS to require this information about FOIA requesters? I do not believe it to be lawful. I believe under binding Supreme Court precedent that the requester's name, city, state, affiliation, and a brief description of any lesser known organization's mission is irrelevant to the disclosure. Now, whether this information is incidentally collected throughout the process, obviously a FOIA requester must identify him or herself to the agency, mm -hmm. right? And typically they identify their city and state um, so that they may receive records. But the use of this criteria for the processing, redaction, or withholding of records, I think, is plainly unlawful. Okay. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The ranking member is recognized for five minutes. Yes, Mr. Edwards, uh, just tell me something. Um, do you, uh, can you tell us whether the, you know, over the wires now, they have got uh, something that the chairman said earlier today. He said um, this whole thing reeks of a Nixonian enemies list. And I was just wondering, in your review, and in fairness to everybody, um, did you find that to be the case? Did you find any evidence of that kind of atmosphere? No, and I'd like to expand if I could. Yes, please. Um, we, our scope of our investigation or inspection was to look at the process. We looked at the process from the beginning to the end. And we found we had some heartburn over the significant review process. And the job that you have me to do is to look to see if DHS programs and operations add value. And that's all I did. Right. Now, well, let me ask you this. Did you find that questions concerning the identity of the requester uh, were asked in order to impact the amount of information that would be disclosed? I only looked at the processor, and I cannot comment on that. Well, I want to I be fair to everyone again. On page 11 of your report, you said this. After reviewing information and interviewing DHS for your experts, we determined that, that the significant request review process did not prohibit the eventual release of information. Is that accurate? That is correct, sir. But, but if you look at the Attorney General's March 2009 memo, and unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles have no place in the new era of open government that the President has proclaimed. And also, if you look at the January 2009 President's memo, memo it, in responding to requests under FOIA, executive branch agencies should act promptly and in a spirit of cooperation, recognizing that such agencies are servants of the public. So we should not have any delays. Right. Because when it is done, it should be. But, however, when we looked at it, we did not find anything that, that was changed or they, uh, they abstracted from sending things out. Did you, did you find that anybody was disadvantaged, to your knowledge? Well, we are exposing the Department to go beyond this 20-day statutory timeline, and also we are exposing the Department to legal risk. Mm -hmm. How, I haven't done any legal analysis on that, however. Don't, let me tell you why I'm asking you that. In your report on page 20, you say no FOIA officer said that requesters were disadvantaged because of their political party or uh, particular area of interest. Is that, that, that's, is that accurate? That's accurate. Now, your report highlights several initiatives that DHS has already taken to implement the President's uh, and Attorney General's FOIA guidance on proactive disclosure and the presumption of disclosure that are not fully discussed in your written testimony. Can you elaborate on the steps the Department has taken to improve the FOIA uh, operations since January 2009? Yes, sir. As discussed in your report. Yes, sir. The uh, DHS uh, privacy officer slash uh, FOIA officer has taken several steps towards this proactive measure. They, ha uh, they have uh, biweekly meetings, uh, keep the rest of because it is a decentralized FOIA process. The components have their own FOIA officers and the headquarters, uh, eight headquarters offices, as well as the uh, privacy offices serviced by the chief privacy officer. Um, they have training, they have biweekly conference calls. They send staff to help out. So there's a number of things that the FOIA officer has taken into consideration to improve the process. And also there are eight uh, methods in which posting calendars and historical information, uh, FOIA logs, all of them are, are posted. And they also have the electronic reading room in place as well. So they have done a number of things, and we credit them for that. But they need to go even further. And, Mr. Verdi, just one question. Um, you were saying that certain political review 
uh, was, was inconsistent with Supreme Court decisions? Is that right? Is that what you said? Yes, yes. Uh, it's inconsistent with Supreme Court decisions. So you would, so when Mr. Fong, you were here when he testified, right? I was. The general counsel. When he says uh, it is not only legal, legally permissible, a sound managerial practice for the Office of the Secretary to be informed of and in coordination with the Chief four-year officer to play an active role in overseeing the Department's four-year processes, that is not inconsistent with that, is what you are saying? I believe that that statement is correct, but mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the criteria used in this circumstance um, it are unlawful. Um, the general statement that those individuals may play a role in such review, I think, um, is uncontroversial. Mm -hmm. The criteria, however, that it's political criteria as opposed to statutory legal criteria based on the exemptions, um, that is where I, I differ as to this specific program. Right. My time is expired. Right. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Verdi, uh, on a previous subcommittee, uh, we heard testimony from Mr. Earl Devaney from the RAP Board that cited um, three agencies um, for most noncompliant with fraud, waste, and abuse, um, the second one being DHS. How does this go along with the process? I, I, hold on one step. Let's go a step further. We actually heard uh, Ms. Callahan talk about the Herculean efforts um, going to catch up um, on some of the bureaucracy or trying to catch up on some of these FOIA requests. And I'm having a hard time here. Uh, I'm a businessman. I'm a dentist. Um, I actually watch government. Um, seven groups have to hang my television, and I'm perfectly capable to do it myself. How does this process and how do these delays um, cause increased costs to the American taxpayer? Well, it is clear that these sorts of delays result um, in increased litigation. Um, EPIC has been forced to litigate FOIA requests to obtain the disclosure of records um, that we otherwise could have obtained directly from the agency without litigation costs um, and through the normal FOIA process if the deadlines had been met. And the way that this impacts the cost of the American taxpayer is that the FOIA statute contains a fee shifting provision and a cost shifting provision. And what that means is that when FOIA requesters are required by the agency to go to litigation to force disclosure of records, they can obtain fees from the agency. Um, often, uh, EPIC litigates our own cases, um, and we have recovered fees from agencies on this basis. Um, those fees come directly from agency budgets, and they, at the end of the day, are funded by the taxpayer. Hmm. So um, we were building up a bureaucracy within a bureaucracy, right? It is. And, and those costs are avoidable. Um, if agencies work with requesters to meet statutory deadlines, then there is no need for litigation and there is no need to invoke that fee shifting provision. Do you see a reason um, if an individual aside privacy issues. Um, if an individual is giving a, uh, given a FOIA, why it shouldn't be just broadcast to anybody? I, I see no reason. And I think affirmative disclosure by the agency can be a powerful tool for increasing transparency and increasing open government. So once, once we go through one individual, we sh it could be used like in a mass media aspect where we allow the individuals all around America to pick and choose through um, the, um, you know, like uh, technology driven. There are many uh, technologies that enable one to many communications um, that the Department could leverage in order to uh, better publicize the documents that are requested by individual FOIA requesters and make them more widely available. Okay. So, so a definite streamlined process should be in order. I agree. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edwards, um, these FOIAs have had a kind of a chilling effect on, um, or this, these delays have had a chilling effect um, on the FOIA request. I'm also from Arizona, and we've got a lot of problems with our uh, southern border. Um, we've got a lot of violence. How do you think this could have implicated the process, particularly of FOIA, and maybe getting proper information out to the proper authorities? Without getting into specific uh, FOIA cases, uh, I, my team went ahead and did a review of the FOIA process. And what we found was there's, uh, even though in 2009 there was 103,000 and 2010 there was 130,000, 70 percent of that was immigration alien files, uh, there were still a number of FOIAs that 
once they had completed, they could have gotten out of the door and it still ended up in the review process. The one, one and a half percent, they're talking about the 662, which ended up in the significant review process, that also should not have been delayed. So uh, I cannot really sp speak to the specific uh, BOYA case, but this is what was our uh, scope and this is what we observed. Were there potential cases involving the, our, our Border Patrol um, law enforcement on our southern border that could have been implicated by such a FOIA? Do you know of such? I don't know of such, sir. I'll yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Ross, are you prepared? And I yield you five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Verdi, I understand your organization has made a few requests in the past. Um, and, and, and I guess over the years um, you have had some adequate responses and some inadequate responses. My, my question to you is, is that based on your experience, uh, have you seen an improvement in the last year uh, uh, for, for your FOIA re requests, or has it been declining or stayed the same? Um, sadly, we have maintained a 100 percent noncompliance rate, or rather the agency has maintained a 100 percent noncompliance rate with EPIC's requests um, over the past year in terms of meeting statutory deadlines. So we have neither seen an improvement nor, I think, a degradation in the response. And, and, and these have been based on just grammatical errors or have been substantive errors? Or, or why have the requests not been granted in a timely fashion? Uh, they simply have either not responded um, to the request, they have asserted exemptions, again, outside the statutory period right. um, that we then had to challenge through the administrative process. But in any case, we did not receive documents um, prior to the 20 working day deadline. Um, in many cases, the agency also violated the deadlines for processing administrative appeals. And in one circumstance, um, the agency missed its deadline to answer a lawsuit um, in which we were trying to force disclosure of documents. So in, in other words, there has been absolutely no change other than maybe worse. I have not seen a material change. Okay. Uh, recently, there has been, um, since President Obama entered into office, he has issued three memorandums relating to transparency and open, open government issues. Uh, two of those memorandums, one regarding the Freedom of Information Act and one regarding transparency and open government, were released on the President's first full day in office. And then uh, Attorney General Eric Holder uh, instructed the, um, uh, by memorandum the, the Chief uh, FOIA officer to support career staff by ensuring that they have the tools necessary to respond promptly and efficiently to FOIA requests. Um, the, the President has emphasized on several occasions uh, the need and requirement that there be an efficient and immediate response and transparency to FOIA requests. In fact, in January of 2009, he stated, in the face of doubt, openness prevails. The government should not keep information confidential merely because public officials might be embarrassed by disclosure, because errors and failures might be revealed or because of speculative or abstract fears. Nondisclosure should never be based on an effort to protect the personal interests of government officials at the expense of those they are supposed to serve. Uh, my question to each of you is, do you feel that the Department's front office review process uh, comports with the President's objectives uh, to FOIA? And, Mr. Edwards, I will start with you. Well, as we look through the process, uh, particular interest came to us about the significant review process, because that had changed from the 2005 practice. So starting September 2009, there, has to, there was a review and concurrence, right. uh, which uh, really delayed the process. Um, we have brought this to their attention, and we have a number of recommendations, and uh, the Department has uh, taken efforts to put the SharePoint site in place. Uh, it was a three-day uh, notice, and now it has changed as of this Monday to a day. So I think the Department has made a number of changes. Just recently? Just recently. Right. Uh, Mr. Verdi? Um, I think that the basic act of flagging specific requests based on this criteria, this politically um, sensitive criteria, is inconsistent um, with the President's commitment in this area. Okay. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Verdi, I would like you to elaborate on that. You earlier said, if I understood correctly, and I will just paraphrase, that sending information to political appointees uh, so that they are aware, let's just say 
a press office, sending them as they go out or substantially as they go out would not violate FOIA so that essentially the press office could respond when the press, now having this information, asked questions. That part is just fine, right? Correct. So it is really the advanced notice and with the ability to act that really distorts the process, whether they act to spin beforehand or they act to actually change the material release for both of you. Those would, that's where the lines crossed, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is the combination of delay, which is unlawful insofar as it, it violates the statutory deadlines, um, and the use of criteria um, that have been labeled irrelevant by courts and, and, and by lawmakers uh, to make a determination concerning a FOIA request. Those are the two aspects that, that I believe are objectionable in this circumstance. Thank you. I thank you, the gentleman. And, and I guess I am the last, so I will yield myself five minutes and it, this, will be the, this will be the close. Uh, first of all, it, we are correct. We are really, for both of you, you are really dealing with 662, to use the number that apparently is the most accurate number today. Those are the ones that were subject to delay or interference, not the rest of the files, as far as we know. Is that right? Yes. And as to the IG, and, and that is as far as I know, based okay. on the committee report. That has nothing to do with excess redacting that you may find in those process. Mr. Verde, they talked about uh, redacting. In your experience, how often have you prevailed when you finally get through the process of what you originally got versus what you ultimately are entitled to after you object to the amount of redacting? What is the ratio? How often do you prevail? Um, we, we almost universally prevail on at least some redactions. So there is no, a pervasive not at all. right, but there's a pervasive problem clearly, and I think the IG would agree that if you fail, if if redacting is over relative to secondary review, even when it doesn't involve these 662, that says something about getting from where prior presidents have been to where this president rightfully so said he wanted to go. Is that right? I think that overredaction is a real problem. Um, it is a clear problem for FOIA requesters like Epic. Um, I think it's an even larger problem for FOIA requesters who have less legal expertise and are less able to challenge those redactions in the administrative process and in the, in the litigation process. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Uh, and by the way, thank you for your report. I, I realize the scope of your investigation was limited, very different than ours, but I thought it was overall very, very good work. Did you look at SharePoint and how it works in your investigation? No, sir. Uh, we, we became aware of the SharePoint system, the new platform, and the three days uh, where people can, uh, uh, the components can submit their responses, and, and um, after three days, uh, they can get it out of the door, and that, that changed to a day this Monday. We have not had Coincidence of our hearing notwithstanding. We have not had an opportunity to, to assess the system or because our scope was to just look at the process. Do you plan on looking at that, if, SharePoint? If that is something that the Chairman wants us to do. Uh, I think the Chairman and Ranking Member both would like you to look at it. Uh, one of my companies that I am affiliated with in the past has SharePoint. So I am aware that one of the things it actually has a power to do, and, and you will have to see whether the version you bought as is implemented, is in fact it can partial share. It is designed so that you can look at, for example, that political review could be limited so it wouldn't see the source of who it was from, at least in the macro sense. Uh, so I would like you to look into it and give us a, a view on whether or not SharePoint could meet your high standard of eliminating this one-day delay altogether, eliminating any chance that information, although publicly required and publicly disclosed later when this material is put on the website, uh, could be not available to those doing the review. As the ranking member said, it smacks of the Nixonian era, who are my enemies? And if your enemy is uh, Mr. Verde or it is the Associated Press, the question is, why does a political appointee need to do it if, in fact, they are just reviewing on behalf of making sure the Secretary is informed? Uh, the, uh, question that is, remains, did your investigation, you are familiar with the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Secretary having done the, her own reviews, in other words, doing her own searches for FOIA discovery. Are you familiar with that? No, sir. Okay. That would be the other one that I am interested in. We found that 
in some cases, rather than FOIA professionals, political appointees did their own reports. My understanding, and I think all of us who have ever done a Google search understand, that the results are only as good as the input. So if you input less than would be responsive, you get back less than what a FOIA professional would, would get in order to fully disclose as the President envisioned. So although those were not the main topics today, uh, I would appreciate it if you would look into them. I am particularly concerned with the idea that you have all these career professionals who are very capable of doing full disclosure and making redacting decisions, and then you have some of the material eventually delivered to the press and others having been self-selected by people, and whether they are political appointees or, as I found with the Mineral Management Service, what they thought was important to Congress to know, and we found out it with the British Petroleum problem, was much less than we should have known. So uh, those areas, I would appreciate your, your looking into it as you see it fit and letting us know. I want to take this moment to thank both of you. You did a, a lot of good work. Your report is, is good work. And this committee has a special place in its heart for two groups sunlight people who, who serve no purpose other than getting the truth out of government, which we benefit from, and the IGs, who are absolutely essential. We do not, we wouldn't even know about 90 percent of what we ultimately become interested in if not for your fine work and those in your field. So I want to thank you all. This was an important hearing. It is not the last Freedom of Information hearing. It is the not the last sunset or uh, sun, sunlight type of a uh, hearing, but it was an important one. I thank you, and we stand adjourned.